Hi, I make snails. You may have seen me around on TikTok and Instagram. I make polymer clay snails based on a wide variety of different themes and characters that people suggest. And I get a lot of questions about the techniques and specifics that go into the snails. So I thought it would be a good idea to make a long format YouTube video where I really take an in-depth look at the step-by-step -step process of making a snail. If you guys have any suggestions on how to make the YouTube video better, please leave a comment. I'm always looking to learn more. Today I'm making a witch snail, so I'm going to take this cone-shaped shell and pour some liquid Sculpey down inside of the cavity just to add a little bit extra support to the inner structure of the shell. This is a step that's really more necessary with a more delicate shell. For this particular one, I probably could have gotten away with it, but since it's part of the process, I thought I would show it. I'm going to rotate the shell so that that liquid can kind of settle into the deeper recesses, and then I'm going to fill the main opening of the shell with some Super Sculpey. Previously, I've also worked a lot with Original Sculpey, but I've recently switched to Super Sculpey and I really enjoy the firmness of it, as well as the fact that after it's baked, it's much less brittle. And I'm all about trying to extend the life of my pieces as much as possible. So I'm just gonna fill up that cavity and make sure that I leave some extra clay on the outside to make blending it into the body easier. And then I'm going to take some wire to make some support structure to run between the shell and the body. So I have this electric fence wire. Uh, it's the cheapest and best that I've found as a support wire. And I'm just going to take a small chunk of it and bend it into this sort of S shape with a small hook at one end and a larger kind of swirled hook at the other end. That smaller end is going to go up inside the shell and I need to bend that in such a way that it will fit within the curve of the particular shell that I'm using. And then that larger uh, swirled part of the hook is going to stick out and is going to actually be the part that goes into the body of the snail to attach it and just give that kind of extra anchor between the shell and body. For that body, I'm going to take the same Super Sculpey and roll out a sort of short, fat snake with a tapered tail on one end. And then I'm going to kind of adjust that body shape to fit my theme. So maybe a little thinner, a little shorter, longer, thicker, whatever. And then I'm going to make sure that I keep that body as smoothed out and nice and clean as I can throughout the process. Because it's much easier to keep things nice as you go than to try and clean everything up at the end. So I'm going to smooth that out where I shorten the clay. And then I'm going to work on shaping the mouth. And to do that, sometimes I'll use a tool, but I've really found the best thing for it is just to use my finger. I've got five of them here. They're all different sizes, so I just kind of pick the one that seems to fit the best. And then once that mouth shape is kind of where I want it, I will take the body of the snail and I like to put it on some kind of a platform or surface that I can easily move around so that I don't have to worry about changing the shape once I've kind of got it where I want it. So I have these metal cards that I just got from the dollar store. I'm going to stick the snail down on there and kind of start to pose it. I know that I want this snail to be holding something, but I'm not quite sure exactly what just yet. So I'm going to make sure that I pose it in such a way where you can see the tail. And this is also going to give a good view of the shell itself. Just going to make sure that it's really firmly attached to the card before I bring the shell in. Now, none of my snails would ever fit inside of their shells, but I like to try and attach the shell in the most realistic way possible so that the opening is facing more out towards the head. And I'm going to make sure that that anchoring wire is just firmly in there, and then I'm going to start to blend that extra clay that we left on the outside into the body of the snail, just again to help really cement it and attach it and make it so that this is all one piece together. I'm going to kind of blend the clay together in stages using this ball tool and my fingers where I can reach to kind of get the general shapes blended together. And then I like to use this silicone tipped tool to really get into the little crevices. This is a tool I get a lot of questions about. It's originally marketed as a nail design tool. Um, it's just a silicone tipped brush, but the texture of it and the give that it has is really nice and a good alternative to my fingers where they can't reach. Um, and it also is tapered so that it can fit into these little tiny areas, um, like up underneath the shell here where my fingers just really can't quite get to. So now that I've kind of got that all blended together, let's get this little lady set aside for a moment and talk about the things that I use for eyes. I have a wide variety of glass spheres that I like to use. Uh, most of these are sold as boiling stones that are used um, in a lot of lab settings and stuff. I'm going to be totally honest, I don't entirely get what they're used for. It's something to do with boiling 
liquids and stuff, but they're just little glass spheres. It's really hard to find cabochons that are small enough for me to use for the snails. These are some of the smallest I've found, and I do sometimes use them when I really need like a lot of detail and focus in the eyes, but they're very expensive because they're hard to make so small, and so I tend to stick to these four millimeter boiling stones. Now to give our eyes color, I'm gonna take a strip of clay and stick our eyeballs in it so that most of the eyeball is still exposed, but they can't roll off on me. So I'm actually making six of these witch snails, so I have a bunch of eyes kind of pre-started. Uh, these have a layer of glitter paint already on the back half of them. I'm gonna take some black acrylic paint and just add another layer on top of that glitter paint so that it will, um, so that when you look at the eyeball from the front, you'll see through to the glitter with the black behind it. And I'm hoping that that's gonna make the glitter more visible. So just a thin layer, I'm gonna apply it with this Q-tip so that I don't have a whole bunch of overspill. It's not the end of the world if I get a little bit on the clay and like run it down the side of the eyeball, but yeah, and, and there I did it. <laughs> but the, the more clean of a line, always the better. So I'm gonna take some more of our electric fence wire and use that as the support structure for our eye stalks. So I'm gonna take some Sculpey polymer clay adhesive. Now this is different than the stuff that we poured inside of the shell earlier. This stuff, I like to keep it in this little plastic container because it keeps the pet hair and the dust off of it. And I hate to waste any, it just takes a little tiny bit. I'm gonna add it to the end of this wire and it will help the clay to stick to the wire. I cannot begin to tell you how many times I've had issues making these little finicky eye stalks and having the clay just slip off of the wire. So this makes things so much easier with shaping and getting everything connected. And the wire is really a necessary part for making sure that these eye stalks are as sturdy as I can possibly get them. So I'm gonna just put a little clay tapered on the end here and stick that other end of the wire down into the body of the snail. Then once I've got it kind of positioned back where I had made that initial hole, I'm going to take my tools and also use my fingers to blend the fatter end of that eye stalk down into the body of the snail. Generally, I like to try and go for a shape where the base of the eye stalk is more flared as it goes into the top of the head, and then the top is more tapered as it goes up to where the eyeball will connect but I try to make sure that I leave a little bit of extra clay there at the top just to make blending the eyeball into the eye stalk a little bit easier. I could certainly go ahead and taper it down as thin as it'll possibly go to the wire, but then you risk the wire scraping the paint off the back of the eyeball when you attach it, and that's a whole problem that there really isn't much of a fix for besides repainting the eye on the outside, and I try to avoid that as much as possible. So kind of mess around with it, coax it into a shape I like, and then I gotta do the same with the other eye stalk. And then once I have both of those on there and like the way they look, now it's time to put the eyeballs on. So here we have our eyeball. It's nice and dry. You wanna make sure that paint is totally dry before we move on. And here you can kind of see a little bit of that glitter I was talking about showing through the other side. So to get the eyeball ready to attach, I'm gonna take a small ball of clay that's about the same size as the eyeball, and I'm gonna just smoosh them together and make them kiss so that the painted part of the eyeball is enveloped in that clay. I'm gonna kind of clean up the edges, make sure that it's looking pretty nice, and then I'm gonna stick that to the top of the eye stalk. From here, it's gonna be a lot of very careful blending. I'm gonna blend the eye stalk up into the eye, as well as the eye down into the eye stalk, just to really make sure that that area is very well homogenized and blended together so that there are no seams or tiny pockets of air that could exist in between there. It's very rare that I have any breakage occur, but in the past when I have had breakage, this is the area it happens. So I really take the time to make sure that this is all very well blended and as structurally sound as I can possibly get it. It's just a delicate area though. So, you know, if you have a snail, please don't drop it on its eyes. So this is a lot of just really tedious kind of blending and shaping to get the eye exactly where I want it but I'm going to magically give it another eye and we're going to start working on this little gal's expression. 
Now snails don't have a whole lot of face to work with, but we do have a few things at our disposal to give some attitude. So I'm gonna take a little tiny piece of clay that I'm gonna flatten and smush with my finger, and this is gonna be an eyelid. So I'm just going to delicately place and attach those eyelids to each eye and then kind of coax it into the shape and expression that I am looking for. Now she has these glittery eyes, which really require the light to be able to hit the back of them to really fully shine. And I felt like even though these eyelids are going to kind of obscure that a little bit, it was necessary because I really wanted her to have a little more attitude in her expression. She's a witchy lady. She knows what's up. She's got the power. She's got the tood, you know? So I'm going to just kind of coax those eyelids into place where I want them. And then I'm going to give her a little smirk down here with my silicone brush. Kind of push that corner of her mouth up and roll down to smooth that area. Then you're going to see me take my fingers and kind of push her face back a little bit slimmer just to kind of get her back into shape. Then I decided I wanted to give her some lips. So I took this little ball of clay and I'm going to just press it on to make sure that it's not going to run away on me. And then I'm going to use my silicone brush tool to blend the edges of that, kind of constantly supporting that with one hand or one finger, I suppose, and tapering those corners down into the edges of her mouth. I'm going to kind of check my expression that she has constantly and try and make sure that those lips are following along the line of her smirk. Just kind of blending and shaping as I'm also making sure that that clay is attached. Now I'm going to start working on shaping the bow part of her mouth. I'm going to take just the tip of my silicone brush tool and kind of press that in while supporting from the bottom to give that nice shape. And then I'm going to use the other side of my silicone tool to kind of flatten her lips to give a little bit more definition to the arch of the top of her lips, if that makes sense. <laughs> A little more fiddling around and touching up, and now she has a face. For the coloration of her fleshy skin, I'm going to use these soft pastels. For these witches, I've decided to keep it old school and make them green skinned. So I'm gonna take this green soft pastel stick, not oil pastel, that's important. And I have these little containers that I like to keep my excess shavings in just so that nothing is going to waste. And a lot of the time these colors I like to reuse. So it just, it's helpful. So I'm gonna take a blade and lightly shave off a fine powder from this pastel stick. It's very important that you do this lightly. And if you go too fast or too hard, you're gonna get big chunks of pastel mixed in with your fine powder. And that can cause all sorts of problems. So. We want to go light and slow. Obviously this is sped up, don't go this fast. And then I'm going to use some just regular makeup brushes like you might find at the dollar store or the drugstore or whatever. You might even just have some leftover laying around, some old brushes. These are the best I've found for packing pigment on. So I'm going to just take a little bit of this powder pigment now and brush it lightly onto the surface of the snail. Now at this point, I've already decided that our witch is going to be wearing a dress, so I'm not gonna do her full body. I'm just gonna do the majority of her head and face, as well as the end of her tail, the parts of her that I know are gonna be showing. Um, I'm probably gonna do some around the edge of the bottom too, just in case anything shows through, but in, in the end, it won't. I've developed a tendency to try and be as thorough at each stage of the process as I can possibly be, just in case I end up changing my mind or have something come up later where maybe I want tears in the dress so that parts of the edges of her are gonna show through or something goes wrong and I have to make the dress in a different way or, or whatever. So, But it's also good to try and conserve as much material as I go. So I try to kind of account for things while not over accounting for things. I'm going to support her eye stalks very delicately as I press the powder pigment into the surface of the clay. You'll see me kind of using a tapping motion um, along with a bit of a stroke, but I'm not going to just make strokes on her skin like I'm painting her. I found that the best way to get the pigment to stick is to more press it into the surface than smear it on the surface. 
just to really pack it on and get full coverage. Now I've decided to add a little bit of variation and take some of this yellow that I have from another time and add that as well. This is gonna be a pretty subtle color variation once everything is said and done, but it does add a bit more depth and just makes her coloration a little bit more interesting. I'm gonna go in and add this to all of the places where I see that maybe the green is a little bit thinner or a little bit lighter, places that are gonna be kind of more of like the highlight of her body, like the top of her nose, the top of her tail, that kind of thing. I'm also going to take a couple of other colors like this pink and add a little bit to her cheeks as well as her mouth and her eyelids. Just again, to add a little bit more variation, maybe make her look a little bit more alive, a little bit more lifelike. And again, it's going to be very subtle in the end, but I think it really is worth the time and effort. A lot of those little subtle details might not show up the best in the photos and the videos that I take, mostly because I'm not the best photographer or videographer, but I think they really are worth it and make a big difference in the end physical sculpture. And that's what matters the most to me. So now that she's got her skin color on, I've decided I want to texture her skin a little bit. So I have this dotting tool that I'm just going to lightly dimple her skin with. And again, it's a small detail, but one that I feel lends a lot to the finished sculpture. Now I've noticed this little spot in her eye stalk area where I didn't quite have things blended and then the edge of it caught a little bit more of that extra pigment powder and it's visible there. I could stress about fixing it, but in my experience, it's much easier to just leave it be. Uh, once the powder pigment is on the surface of the clay, it doesn't quite behave the same way when it comes to blending and doing detail changes. Since it's gonna be in an area that's gonna be covered by her hair anyway, I decided just to leave it. So next I'm gonna work on posing her tail to hold this little opalite star that I have. It's very fun, very witchy. I thought it would be a fun thing to have her holding. So I'm gonna just kind of coax her tail up into a position that I think will work for grabbing onto that star. And then I'm gonna place it there to kind of check the positioning, make sure everything fits properly. And then at that point, she's gonna be ready to go into the oven. Now that star is essentially made of glass, so it's totally fine to go in the oven at the temperature that she'll bake at. It's gonna take about 20 minutes. And then when she comes out, I'm gonna take the star off of her and I'm gonna start working on painting. For her, the only painting I'm really gonna be doing for now is working on this sort of belly or what's technically called the foot of the snail. I'm only gonna paint the areas that are gonna be peeking out from her dress, kind of the same uh, way of thinking about it as we did when we were doing her skin pigmentation. I'm gonna just kind of do this mouth area, her kind of chest sort of area, and then the area on the underside of her tail where it's gonna be peeking out from her dress and then coming up to wrap around that star. Now this is just acrylic paint and I've had pretty good luck with most brands and most pigments, but certain pigments and certain brands will behave a little bit differently in the oven. Uh, so definitely if this kind of sculpture stuff is something you're interested in trying, I would suggest doing a tester, you know, bake a little piece of clay, take it out, paint on it a few different colors, pop it back in the oven, see what happens and make sure they hold up. Every now and then you'll get a brand that'll crack or, you know, just behave kind of weirdly. So it's always better to kind of check it before you wreck it, unless you're like me and you just kind of run for it. There's oftentimes ways that things can be fixed, but it's always less of a headache if you know what you're walking into. Now, next I'm gonna start working on her dress. So I have this handy dandy like pasta clay roller Super helpful for getting a uniform thickness on a slab of clay. You can certainly hand roll as well, but I'm gonna just take some more of that liquid clay adhesive that I talked about earlier when we were doing the eye stalks, and I'm gonna put this everywhere that I think the dress is going to go. I'm gonna just try to get a thin coat, but a complete coat before I start figuring out her dress. So I've just kind of popped her on there and I'm gonna just kind of eyeball it and guess the approximate size and shape that I'm gonna need to be able to tailor this dress to fit this snail body. It's a hard thing to try and describe. Uh, at this point, I've gotten pretty used to the approximate uh, shape and size that I'm going to need to be able to wrap around and fit the body. But a, a snail body and a snail shape is a weird thing to try and fit around. So you just gotta kind of work with it. 
I'm just going to push the clay up around her body and try to form things as I go, kind of following the flow of the clay itself, where the clay wants to bend, where the clay wants to fold, because that's going to get me the closest to an actual more fabric-like fold. And that's going to kind of depend on whether or not you're trying to mimic a thinner fabric or a thicker fabric or, you know, the fit of it, whatever. But the main goal right here right now is just for me to try and get this clay shaped and molded and blended as best I can to be the form of the dress that I want it to be. And later I'm going to go back in and add more folds and things to make it more fabric-like. But the blending and the overall shape is the main focus right now. So I'm getting ready to put the stamp in the bottom of her. This is just my artist stamp that I've made out of clay and some wire and some resin. I'm going to just stamp that on the bottom. I put it on all of my snails, but since I'm getting ready to place her back on that metal card, it just makes sure that that part's done and I don't have to try and pry her off of there later and, and reapply that. So I'll do that at this step so that now that she's firmly attached to the card, I can work on better shaping that, cutting out for her tail where I want it, making sure that that black clay is firmly onto the surface of her body, that there are no air pockets. And here you can see I've run into a place where I've thinned out the clay and her skin is showing through. You got to keep an eye out for that and make sure that you blend that over. Otherwise, it would be much more pronounced later after baking. So better to take care of that now. Next, I'm going to start working on making some different folds in the fabric. And I wanted the ends of her dress to be kind of tattered and torn. So you're going to see me take this needle tool and kind of tear that up a little bit and then use my silicone brush tool to kind of make that a little bit more flowy and folded just by pressing the tip of this tapered tool in you can get a lot of really good folding textures now after i've kind of got some of that done my next focus is going to be on the collar of her dress i ended up having to add a little extra clay because i didn't quite have enough so i'm just going to blend that in as best i can and then i'm going to give her this sort of turtleneck or sweater type collar on her dress forgot to record that part but you'll see it here shortly I didn't worry too much about the back side because her hair is going to cover it and I've decided to give her a witch's hat that's going to need some support. So I'm going to take this little hand drill and go ahead and drill a place carefully supporting her on the other side but not pressing on the eye stalks so that I can put that wire in there that'll give her point part of her witch's hat some extra support. But I figured if I did that now I wouldn't have to worry about trying to go through her hair and everything. So. Again, with the clay adhesive on one end of that piece of wire that's going to just stick in there. And then I'm going to spread that clay adhesive all around the back of her head where the baked clay is. That way it gives a place for the new wet clay of her hair to adhere. Her dress will be just fine because it's already moist. But I'm going to take this orange and black clay. So I'm just going to take a little pieces of this clay and kind of awkwardly in the corner of the camera here, I'm going to roll those into some long tapered pieces that I'm then going to shape into a kind of wavy S shape and then place on her head, making sure that I am touching both the clay adhesive at the top of her head and anchoring it to the unbaked raw clay of her dress at the bottom. Then I'm going to take my favorite silicone tipped brush tool and I'm going to press into the clay probably a little harder than it looks in the video uh, just to make sure that I really press it into and attach it firmly to the surface of the snail as well as giving it that sort of hair texture. And I do this to each piece as I place it rather than doing it after placing all of the hair pieces because it just makes it a lot easier to have have more depth of that texture because it'd be really hard for me to reach up underneath each piece to try and texture the pieces below it if I did it the other way. So I'm just going to keep kind of going a piece at a time and adding and placing and texturizing hair as I go. Careful to support her because since that dress is still raw unbaked clay, I could potentially press her in such a way that she'd get moved and the dress might get messed up and stuff. So always support as you go just to make things easier on yourself and avoid catastrophe. Once I've got her hair all on, I'm going to start working on her hat. So I have another slab of clay that I've rolled out and I have these super handy dandy circle cutters. I'm going to use the biggest one for the brim of her hat and I'm going to do that first. So just cut out a nice big circle. 
And then I'm going to use a craft blade to take it off the table so that I can try to avoid altering the shape of it as much as possible. Now it's always important when using these kinds of cutters to dress your edges. So you look at it here, it's kind of rough, it's just cut. So I'm going to use my fingertips to kind of smooth that and round those edges just so that everything's nice and finished in the end and we don't have any rough edges. So. Once I've got that nice and smoothed out, I'm gonna take my needle tool once again and I'm gonna poke a hole right in the middle of it where that wire is gonna go through. I could just shove the clay down over the wire and force it down, but I have a greater chance of misshaping my circle if I do it that way. So I'm gonna just pre-make the hole so that it'll slide over with little resistance. And then I can really make sure that I get that uh, brim of the hat placed and positioned and folded how I'd like it to be. I'm gonna make sure that it's touching her eye stalks because it will help support the brim of the hat as well as support her eye stalks a little extra. And support's always good. You gotta get support in there wherever you can. So making sure it's firmly attached and pressed into the hair before I start making the top cone part of her hat. For that, I'm gonna just take another ball of the same black clay, roll it into a sort of teardrop shape, and then I'm gonna start kind of working on flattening and shaping the base of that teardrop shape. I'm gonna use my thumb as a more rounded surface to place it on as well, because her head is a little bit rounded, and just make sure that base is flared out wide enough that it will make blending it onto the surface of the hat brim a lot easier. Once I pretty much have that shape the way I want it, I'm gonna take that needle tool once again, and I'm gonna make a little cavity where that wire can fit up inside, just once again to help avoid any misshaping when I press it on there. I'm gonna take some more of that wonderful Sculpey clay adhesive that I love so much and pour it down into that cavity, just once again to help really make sure that those wires have a bit more grip on the clay once it's baked. I'm gonna support against her lip on the other side as I press the hat on. And then I'm gonna kind of double check to make sure that everything is centered and more or less placed where I want it before I start to blend. For the blending, once again, I'm gonna work from kind of more broad blending into more finer blending. I'm gonna use this ball tipped tool that kind of fits right in the crease there between the hat top and the hat brim and just kind of press those two things together to kind of more securely attach them. I'm going to switch then to this even smaller ball end as I get down into this tighter crevice down here and then I'm going to start working with my silicone tipped brush tool after this to further blend and kind of get rid of some of those markings that the ball tipped tool left behind. So once again, I'm gonna just kind of make my way around the hat, recovering my tracks, making sure things are well blended. And once I'm done with that, I'm gonna use my fingers to further smooth that out. And then I've also decided that the tip of the hat is a bit bulkier than I want it. So I'm gonna gradually kind of pull that clay out and pinch the excess clay off the ends a few times, just until I get that clay lessened and then shaped into more of what I kind of have in mind as being more fitting for this particular snail. Now I decided her hat looks a little too droopy, so I decided to angle that tip up, and then I'm gonna add some fabric folds with my silicone tool once again, as well as some fabric folds there around the base where I blended, where the hat kind of connects into the brim. Now I've decided to give her a little bit of witchy bling. So I have this little glass kind of imitation stone here that I'm gonna add some of that wonderful clay adhesive to the back of, just a little dab will do you for this one. I'm gonna press it firmly into her dress that is still unbaked, just to make sure it's really securely attached. I could make her an actual necklace that hangs loosely, but then I could potentially run into lots of problems with breakage and making sure things are attached securely and things getting in the way. So I'm just going to go ahead and apply it in a way where it's firmly and securely attached. I have this little tiny gold chain that I'm going to put on here, carefully laying it into place where I want it and then pressing it firmly into the clay. Now, why aren't you using clay adhesive on the chain, you might ask? That's because this is such a small and delicate little chain that if I were to use the clay adhesive, it would kind of obscure the individual like rungs of the chain. And I'd really rather keep them as clean and bright and shiny as possible. And I'm pretty 
confident in the security of pressing them into the clay in this instance. So I'm not only making sure that they are placed in such a way as to be into that clay, but I am also then making sure that the ends of the chain are also behind her hair so that they are securely held as well. After that, I'm gonna double check that her opalite star still fits with the added bulk of her dress. And then she is ready to go back in the oven for another 20 minutes. Now that she's nice and hardened and baked from the oven, I decided she needs a nice witchy lip to go with her outfit and tie everything together. So I started out with a layer of black acrylic paint, careful to follow the shape of her lip and kind of continue to emphasize that smirking expression while also making sure to get up underneath her lip so that there's not a weird gap there between her lip and her belly coloration. Once that dried, I decided to take this kind of copper colored metallic acrylic paint and do a layer over her lips as well. Just felt like kind of a fun fall color, sort of witchy, I don't know. It just seemed to fit, I don't know. But I did leave a very thin black outline around her lip as kind of a lip liner to her, to her look. I don't know, I thought it looked cool. What do you think? After that, I decided to tie in that copper color a little bit more with some detailing on her dress. I did this really simple little design around the edge of the bottom of her dress, careful to watch for little folds or places where I had made tears and letting that design kind of follow that organically and trail off where it needed to. Just went around the whole bottom of her dress especially on the underside. Don't forget the underside, it's very important. I decided to color my artist stamp in with that same color as well, just to really bring it all full circle. I like to try and do different little things with my artist stamp sometimes if it seems fitting. Uh, it just kind of depends on the snail, but you know, sometimes it's fun. Next, I have a little bit of that same copper paint on the tip of my finger that I'm going to use to just very lightly and very subtly give her a little bit of like eye shadow at the top here of her eye stalks. An another subtle detail that's going to be hardly noticeable. <laughs> so I wanted to decorate her shell. So I have a couple shades of green and brown that I'm going to just very lightly mix together so that you can still see the individual colors in the mix. I'm gonna use this to make some moss that's gonna be attached to her shell. So I'm gonna take some more of that wonderful adhesive and just kind of place it on the surface of the shell approximately where I want the moss to be. Now, this shell has quite a bit of texture naturally on the surface of it. If this was a really smooth shell, I would take sandpaper and sand it down where I was going to attach it just to give it extra grip. Now, these are some little quartz beads that I have. You can see they have a hole drilled in them. They're meant for, you know, jewelry making and whatnot. But I'm gonna add some adhesive on that side where the hole is because that's the side I don't want showing. Excuse my bad focus. But I'm going to take that green and brown clay mixture from earlier, just a little piece of it, and I'm going to form that around this bottom part of this bead, this crystal, so that I can have a good anchoring point for it on the surface of her shell. I'm gonna kind of just wing my placement, but I'm gonna go with where I think looks the best, where you can see the crystals, see the parts of the crystals that I like the most, and where hopefully nothing will be obscured in the end. So get those placed on there, and then I'm gonna add some more of that same clay around those crystals where I have that adhesive placed just as further support and just for a little extra, you know, a little extra mossiness. I have this little metal scooped shape tool that you're gonna see here shortly, there it is, that I'm gonna use to press into those little tiny crevices and just really firmly smush that clay on there and in there. After that, I have another tool that I'm gonna to use, which is a wire brush tool. It's basically a paintbrush, but the bristles are wire. This is a great texture tool, comes in really handy for fluffy textures, and I love it for moss. I'm gonna just take that, making sure that my bristles are kind of pressed together in a tighter clump, and then I'm going to press it into the clay in sort of a jabbing motion, not too deep though. And as I'm jabbing, I am actually kind of moving in a direction as well. So you'll kind of see me pressing that clay up towards the crystal to cover it, or down towards the shell to spread it out more. And I think 
doing that motion and not just a straight in and out really helps with adding more depth to the sort of moss that we're sculpting here. Having areas that are pressed in and indented further and also areas that are more raised so that there's kind of an undulation to the surface of the moss, I think really adds a lot to the way that it looks in the end. You see me once again, kind of pressing it down onto the shell. And when I do this kind of moss technique, a lot of the times I'll go back in afterwards and take some more of that pastel pigment that we use like for her skin and just kind of lightly go over the surface of the moss as well. I didn't end up doing that in this case because I really liked the variation that I got with the different colors of the clay that I used this time, but it is an option that you can explore if this is something that interests you. So I'm just really gonna go over and make sure every surface of this moss is covered in that texture. After that, she's ready to be baked for the last time. And then I'm finally going to permanently attach that opalite star. Before I do that real quick, I'm gonna one last time just check the fit, make sure it sits in her tail the way I want it to. And then I'm gonna secure it just using this Loctite gel super glue. I like the gel because it doesn't get runny. I've had good luck with the Loctite brand. I'm gonna check this from every angle to make sure that I know exactly at what points that star touches her shell, her tail, her dress, any point on her body where it touches. I'm gonna to put a little bit of glue. I'm gonna make sure I get it in the right spots before I place it. And then when I do place it, I'm gonna do so firmly. And any spot where there's excess glue, I just take like a toothpick or something and wipe it off. Once she has dried fully, I'm going to seal everything with some polycrylic sealant. Now, this polycrylic is a water-based sealant that is typically used in woodworking. It's also low odor, so it's safe to use indoors. And I've just had really good luck with it, come to really kind of depend on it. It's great for making sure that some of these little finer details are really firmly, securely locked to the structure of the snail, which I really like. It gives a little extra support to those areas. It also just kind of gives everything a finished and cohesive look in the end. And there's different finishes of it, like gloss, matte, whatever, but they're all pretty similar. Um, and since these snails are kind of slimy critters anyway, I do like the kind of semi-gloss uh, look that they have afterwards. It also helps to seal in those powder pigments that I used. Um, they're pretty firmly in the surface of the clay there, but if I were to scratch it or something, this just adds a little bit extra ding resistance if something were to hit it. It also, with that glossy finish, I think really brings out some of the details and the more uh, subtle nuances of the coloration with the powder pigments. So I like it for that reason too. I'm gonna just coat the entirety of the snail, make everything nice and glossy. And then that's going to take quite a while to fully cure. It'll be like touchable and workable within a few hours, but generally you wanna give it 24 hours or 48 hours to really fully cure and cement itself in place. Now I should also mention I'm not going to coat the bottom of her in this. I'll get right up to the edge, but not all the way because we're getting ready to add her slime and that I do with UV resin. So first off, we're gonna need this mat. It's just a silicone flat mat, good working surface. I also have a little mixing cup we're gonna use, some glitter that we're gonna use, and on occasion I also use some pigments, but we're just gonna stick to the glitter for this one, I think. I've got a couple of toothpicks I'm gonna use to mix and stir, and this is the resin that I like to use. It's Mr. Resin Brand. I get it off of Amazon. I've had nothing but good luck with it so far, so for now it's, you know, it's what I'm into. I'm gonna pour a little bit of that into my mixing cup. I almost always end up pouring more than I need, but it's a lot easier to have a little excess than it is to be trying to scrounge at the bottom or remix the same once again after you've already mixed it and used it all. So I have a little bit of this kind of like hollow pearlescent glitter. I'm gonna add just a little bit into there. That's gonna be my primary colorant. I suppose you might say. 
for, for this particular mixture of slime. Uh, I like to try and do slimes that are kind of fitting to the subject or the theme. So I don't know, glittery, magical, they just seem to fit. So mix that in really nice and thoroughly. And then I have a little bit of gold powder that I'm going to use as well. Just a tiny bit with this, just enough to kind of give it a, a hint of that kind of golden coppery look, but not so much as to overpower it. And you'll kind of see once I mix, a little goes a long way. Now in this particular instance, I'm mixing this very thoroughly and making sure that it's all very well incorporated, but depending on the effect that I'm trying to get, this isn't necessarily the way that I always do it. It depends on the theme and the snail and what fits with what I'm doing. So just, you know, keep an open mind. There's plenty of places to play around with these things. So I'm gonna grab our snail and I'm gonna do her kind of belly mouth area first. I'm just gonna drop a blob in there and kind of spread it around with a toothpick to kind of make sure that I get up to the edges. This stuff is very liquidy, so you have to be pretty careful with the way that you know I'm tilting the snail, the way that I'm holding her to make sure that it stays in place because it will just run straight down her. It's, it's pretty thin. So I'm gonna cure it using my UV lamp. This is just a nail UV lamp. I got it secondhand at a thrift store. Um, I don't know the specifications off the top of my head, but I'm happy to provide them if you guys are interested. It takes a couple of minutes for it to cure fully. I do like two or three of the one minute cycles on the nail lamp, and then I'm gonna move on to her belly. First, I'm gonna fill in that area where my stamp is because since that's recessed, it has a tendency to hold air bubbles. So I wanna make sure I get some of those out. I'm not opposed to bubbles in the slime since they're you know, slime, snails, bubbles are kind of fun, but I don't want it to be so much so that it's in excess or causes problems with the structure and the, you know, the adherence of the resin to the bottom of the snail. So I'm gonna just kind of continue to add more of that and spread it around across the entirety of the surface of the bottom of her. After that, I'm going to add some more of the clear unpigmented UV resin to the center portion of the bottom of her where I just coated. This is gonna do a few things. It's gonna add a little bit of extra bulk so that once I smush her down to the silicone mat like you're gonna see here in a second, there's a little bit extra that can come out the sides to make her slime more visible. It's also going to make it so that the area underneath of her, once she is cured, that area where the artist stamp is and where the details of her dress are, are a little bit more visible and less obscured by that glitter. I'm gonna also take that glitter and kind of beef up these areas where it did squish out. Um, just so that that way the part of her that you're going to see more, you know, when she's standing up, when she's, when she's sitting there on the shelf or the table or whatever, the part that you're going to see of the slime is going to be the glitteriest part. And then when you pick her up and turn her over, you know, then you'll be able to visibly see the details on the bottom as well. So I'm going to just take that glitter, beef up those areas. I'm also going to cover this portion of her dress where her tail is coming out of because the bottom of her tail would also be producing that slime. So I'm gonna cover the bottom white part that we painted of her tail, as well as that part of her dress where her tail is coming out of. And then she's gonna get blasted with that UV nail lamp. I tend to err on the side of over curing rather than under curing. So she's gonna probably sit in here for a good 10 minutes or so. I'm gonna rotate her every so often. I'm gonna put this mirror underneath of her to help reflect some more of that UV light all around her. And it's gonna take a while, but you just gotta be patient. Uh, I didn't show the whole thing, obviously, cause it's kind of boring, but you know, you turn her around, get her from every possible angle, and then at some point or another, once I feel like the top part has been well cured, I'm going to flip the light up so that it's, you know, a larger area. And then I'm going to flip her over still on the mat to cure that bottom portion of the slime as well. So many times I've tried to take them off the mat too soon and the bottom's been wet. And it gets all messed up. Um, I did on this occasion, after I took her off, I added another layer of just the clear resin to the bottom and cured it as well. That's what you were seeing there, just to kind of make sure that that bottom is as slick and glossy as possible. Now she's nearly done at this stage, but I decided she needs a little finishing touch with some eyelashes here. So I just have some regular old fake eyelashes. I'm going to 
cut it to her size, which is like approximately three little tufts. <laughs> so tiny. There's also a little sticky strip that's on there. You want to take that off as well and then roll it just like you would with your regular fake eyelashes that a person was going to wear just to kind of get a more of an arch shape. Now hers are going on with some more of that super glue, just a real thin layer on there and then carefully put them into place. I'm going to use the back end of my toothpick to further make sure that they are right in the spot that I want them and that they are securely attached at both ends and at every stop along the way to the other end of the eyelash as well. Now at this point I can also kind of shape her eyelashes a little bit, kind of push them up or out. And once I've got that eye done, I do the other, and then I'm going to trim her eyelashes while they are on her. You have to be careful because if you trim them too short, you're left with a mess to clean up after yourself. You gotta take them off and redo the whole thing and it's a hassle, but just very carefully. You can always take off more. You can't as easily add on more. And so just very lightly trimming and working them down to the length that I thought was best fitting. After that, I'm gonna take one little drop of that UV uh, resin once again and put it on each of her eyes. This bulks up the shape of her eyeball. It magnifies that uh, painting that we did on the backside and it helps to further cement those eyelashes in place. And at that point, we're done. So here's my light box where I take all my pictures and videos. Here she is in all her finished glory. I really hope you guys enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe if you'd like me to make more videos like this. Definitely leave comments if you have any suggestions and here's all the other snails that I made to go along with her. If you'd like to see more detailed photos and shorts of these guys and the other snails that I've made, feel free to check out my TikTok and Instagram. You guys are so awesome. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.